Welcome to Classics Confidential. I'm here in London with Dr April Pudsey, who's a lecturer in ancient history at Birkbeck College in the University of London. And we're going to chat today about some of her research on uh, the subject of childhood in Roman Egypt. Thanks for coming on Classics Confidential. Thanks, Jess. Um, so maybe we could start up with quite a general question. How much do we know about childhood in Roman Egypt? Well, we know a fair deal about certain types, aspects of childhood. Uh, so we know what kinds of expectations parents had of their children and the role that children had in the transmission of cultures and family traditions and religious traditions, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. What, of course, we want to know a lot more about is mm -hmm. children's lives from their own perspectives and their everyday experiences, cultures and the relationships that they had with one another and with various different adults, uh, both within the home and outside yeah. of the home. How do we find out about that kind of thing? Is there any way back into that more, I suppose, private or individual aspect of childhood? Well, this is the great thing about Egypt, is that we have a certain type of material that we just don't have from a lot of other areas of the ancient world. So we have literally thousands of papyri that have survived from Egypt from across the first six centuries and, and beyond of, of uh, Egypt. We have documents, particularly documentary papyri, telling us all about uh, various aspects of life involving children. Mm -hmm. And it's from those that we can get a, a sense of, of what kinds of things children were involved in, what expectations were placed on them, but also what kinds of uh, aspects of their life that we can see them mm. taking a role in shaping themselves. And who, I mean, I'm thinking about the authors of the papyri, do, do children ever write things down? We get little snippets of children writing things, and this is where the problem comes in, trying to figure out the child's perspective from other people's wor wor mm. words, yeah. usually adult words. Yeah. Um, but what we do have is all kinds of different materials. So we have not only the typical marriage and, and birth and death records, mm. we also have private letters that mention children, refer to them, talk about children's emotional life and so mm. on. Um, but we also have records of children being uh, formally entering into particular social institutions and groups mm. and, and various informal uh, activities and institutions okay. as well. Okay, can you give an example? So an example might be in some of the urban environments of Egypt, um, the uh, big cities, so for example Oxyrhynchus, I'm working mm. on a, a, a large project uh, examining 5,000 documents from, from Oxyrhynchus and in these we have lots of what we call epicrisis documents and this is the uh, record of the formal system through which boys in particular um, were examined for entry into a gymnasium. Uh, and the gymnasial class was the, the group within uh, urban environments in Egypt that had a lot of uh, privileged status, uh, tax status as well. Yeah. But they held particular, in the same way as in Greek cities, uh, you get the gymnasial groups having uh, a lot of administrative power and control yeah. in, in particular regions. And this is something that's continued through children. It's a hereditary body and children have to be formally examined into this thing. Yeah. So we get lots of documents in Egypt where young boys are being put forward for this examination. And often by not just their parents, but their uncles, their aunts, their grandparents. Mm. Sometimes we see girls being put forward for this as well. Mm. Uh, and we see people younger than 14. We've got one example of a four-year-old boy being put forward right. for gymnasium out of eagerness to, to get him into the system. So age 14, is this quite significant? And is this when childhood stops? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah, this is, it, it's very difficult to define childhood and what the boundaries of it, of it are, even in modern times, yeah. but, but particularly in the ancient world. What we do know is there are certain ages at which particular events uh, uh, mattered. And 14 is the, the age at which boys would typically enter in these social circles, the, the ephebates. Um, but as I say, we sometimes get evidence of mm. eagerness to, to, to get the, the young boys in much sooner. Um, and we have other age groups, so particularly age 10 was the legal age at which children could work. Right. Um, but we often see children uh, of, of slightly younger ages, particularly in the uh, rural contexts, working uh, yeah. as well. 
And I mean, you mentioned that you, you don't have the same kind of source material elsewhere in the empire as you do in Roman Egypt, but do you get the sense that there's something very distinctive about children in Roman Egypt, or is it quite you know, an empire-wide experience that we have certain commonalities? I think there's a, a varied experience of childhood, uh, and I think the biggest factor in determining the kind of childhood you might have had really is your social group. And this is something that could have been similar in different parts of the right. empire. So if you were part of one of this urban, almost elite group entering into the gymnasium, that would give you a very different experience of childhood yeah. than if you were living in, in one of the villages uh, and your main kind of area of life uh, and your activity would have been based on the home or your local community in a slightly different way. Yeah. Uh, and these sorts of things are not Egypt specific. Right. There are peculiarities to the, the particular institutions, but, yeah. but I think the social group is, is more important in determining yeah. what kind of childhood you have. So in terms of this project on the papyri, is it what, what exactly are you doing? Are you, you trawling through them, looking for details on childhood? Are you building a database, making them accessible online, that kind of thing? That's precisely what we're doing, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so we're going through these, uh, we're systematically exploring uh, the documents from uh, a Hellenised metropolis that we know an awful uh, lot about in Egypt uh, over uh, six centuries. Mm. And we're looking at the roles and the institutions and the different kinds of aspects of life where we find children mm. mentioned or where we see some evidence that children uh, have an important role to play. Mm. So we look at the Epic Crisis documents uh, and, and the sort of age groups of children we're trying to find out which particular adults were significant for children's lives mm. uh, and if this varied according to their ages. And, and Things so like their, what their aunts and their uncles and extended family. That, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're finding one particular interesting thing that we're finding is that paternal uncles seem to have played a large role, uh, larger than we might have expected, mm. in lots of aspects of children's lives. So, And this is largely due uh, to cultural factors, but also particular marriage patterns in Roman Egypt. Uh, we know from uh, census documents and other material mm. that uh, as, as women married in Egypt, they joined the household of their new husband. Mm. And this meant that you had lots of households where you had adult brothers with their wives and their children all ah. living together in the same house. Um, is that supported by the archaeological evidence as well? It is, it is. We've got some evidence, though not in Oxyrhynchus, um, but in other areas for the, the households uh, and the way in which the actual houses are structured mm. uh, and developed over time mm. um, that kind of tie in with this kind of family structure. And we also have private letters and other family archives that, mm. that kind of support this, this idea and this notion of the family. Yeah. Um, and we know that from children's perspective, therefore, that the most prominent people in their day-to-day -day home lives would have been paternal uncles and oh. aunts. And More than parents, even? Uh, not, well, well, in association with parents. This mm. is something that it's very difficult to try and to, to, to see from the material, but it's, so it's, it's often a leap. But what we can see in the Oxyrhynchus material, particularly, is it's not just the census documents. We see paternal uncles taking a role even when fathers are still alive, we see the paternal uncles registering them for the epicrisis. We see them sorting out financial affairs. We right. see them arranging apprenticeships <laughs> for their yeah. nephews. And this is something that speaks to the strength of this bond between yeah. paternal, the paternal line, really, yeah. and the yeah. paternal uncles and their nephews. Um, and what about when there isn't a paternal uncle? When there isn't a paternal uncle, um, well, it's difficult to say because we don't see the evidence no. for them. But what we do see is in cases where there's no father uh, or where a child doesn't have a father but mm. still has a mother, um, the maternal uncle right. often takes on the role that the, that fa the father would have okay. taken. Okay. So we see maternal uncles in cases of fatherless children taking mm. on all these important practical and yeah. legal day-to-day -day roles. Oh. Um, and we also see some element of emotional attachment in a lot of private letters we get salutations there's always at the end hi from the kids to their uncle Aww. kind of uh, thing on the end of a lot of letters as well and what about staff that aren't sort of members of the biological kingship group but maybe did they live in the house as well uh, yeah we have a lot of material from egypt uh, relating to wet nurses 
So we have the employment of wet nurses in villages and cities across uh, Roman Egypt, many of whom might have lived either in the household or around it. We know from the census documents there were lodgers, there were slave families within uh, the particular households as well. Many of these would have included wet nurses, mm. tutors and so on. So meaning wet nurses like women who breastfed the mm -hmm. infants from birth to, do you know roughly what age? Well, this is a, another debate <laughs> thing that's it's difficult to say because the material is based on a lot of the medical tech, on Galen in particular, who suggests mm. uh, particular lengths of time for weaning children uh, mm. off, off breast milk onto animal milk. Um, and this is supported in some ways by archaeological material through which analysis of, uh, of the protein in, in bones huh. from infant cemeteries has... Across the empire now, we're talking. Yeah, 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 this is yeah. across the empire. But this is one thing that's very difficult to pull all this material together and make it specific to a, a particular place. Yeah. Um, but what we do know is that the social status of wet nurses was relatively, uh, well, they were relatively well thought of, particularly mm. in, in Egypt. Mm. Um, and in fact, there was a you know it, there was a bit of a um, a debate as to whether or not one should feed one's own child or employ huh. a wet nurse. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. So there's, I'm thinking of one particular letter from a mother to her son, uh, mm -hmm. who's recently become a father, and in it she uh, she bemoans the fact that his his wife's taken on a wet nurse, yes. uh, or well should take on a wet nurse instead of feeding the child. Okay. How interesting, because obviously, I mean, today it's a real kind of contentious issue, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Breastfeeding and whether to and how long for and not so much who should do it, yeah. but, you know, <laughs> it is. Um, are there any, do you get the sense of any other um, sort of hot topics for debate about childhood within the mm -hmm. ancient world? Um, thing, yeah. yeah, things like even looking after the small children, is, it, is that something that, um, you know, people had different opinions about? There, there is some uh, diversity of opinion, but again, with the kind of material from Egypt specifically, it's difficult mm. to, uh, to, to try and get a hold of what kind of debate mm. there might have been. Mm. This is something that comes to play a lot in late antiquity, so from the 4th century onwards, we have some uh, texts, the, the sayings of the Desert Fathers, which give mm. instructions on how to treat children in monasteries, uh, particularly boys, and how to educate them uh, and how to discipline them in a very formally structured manner. But of course, this kind of advice often doesn't reflect real life no, uh, no. Uh, living. <laughs> They're like the Gina Fords of the ancient yeah. world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would be fascinating to, kind of, to know a bit more about the reception of texts and mm -hmm. ideals on, on child upbringing. But um, I mean, thinking some more about uh, similarities and differences between Roman Egypt and the modern world. What really sticks out for you as something that's, you know, very, very different to the modern way we do things? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of uh, slight differences, I think. I think there are lots of things that are very similar. So children were loved and cared for yeah. in the same ways. And particularly, uh, the family bonds uh, were all very, very strong. Um, one thing that does stick out is the apprenticeship uh, uh, engagements of children. So mm -hmm. children would often be apprenticed uh, to a particular craft or trade. Mm -hmm. And this um, is very odd where you've got cases in Oxyrhynchus where you have families who are actually engaged in the trade themselves. So families of weavers, for, mm -hmm. uh, for example. And they send their children out to become uh, expert weavers yeah. <laughs> under the, the tuition of somebody else outside of the home. Oh. And this is really interesting because it, uh, you would expect it, uh, them to be trained within the home. Yeah. And so it tells us something about apprenticeship not just being a means of work or uh, a means of acquiring wealth either through mm. uh, wages or a loan or anything like that. Mm. It's it says something about the expectations of children to, to learn something mm. and to shape relationships outside of their home as well. Yeah. Uh, and what yeah. about this the issue of infant mortality, which I guess would have been much more prevalent in ancient societies in sort of modern Britain, for yeah. instance? Yeah. <laughs> well, we know that in populations in the ancient world, mortality was relatively high um, and that there were various responses to this because it, 
you know, even if we don't know exactly how high mortality rates were, mm -hmm. we know there would have been a perceived risk of mortality. Right. Um, and we do uh, know that, that parents had more children in a way to kind of almost subconsciously to, to respond to this, this risk right. of mortality. Right. Is that, does that come out of the census documents? Yeah, this comes out of the census documents, but also mathematical and demographic modelling. And of course, there are lots of problems with that. And there are lots of problems with the census and what actually it's recording. Yeah. Um, but we do know that uh, from the material that we have, that children were in a world full of other children. And it was a very young population. So yeah. there were more young people than there were old people. And what's about grandparents as well because that helps you know the life expectancy issue I suppose yes affects how many grandparents <laughs> are around as well yeah, yeah. this is interesting we, we do have a lot of evidence for grandparents particularly grandmothers yeah. um, and because uh, women tended to marry younger and outlive their husbands yeah. because of their uh, uh, mortality and life expectancy um, we do see grandmothers more often than yeah. grandfathers. Yeah. But again, it's paternal grandmothers that we, we see quite a lot. So oh. the children's father's mother. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. So yes. We, we see that bond coming through quite a lot. And in lots of cases, these grandmothers are relatively young by modern day standards. So we've got grandmothers in their 40s uh, yeah. acting on behalf of their, their children, uh, grandchildren particularly if those grandchildren are happen to be fatherless or orphaned, yeah. Yeah. the grandmother might often make all the arrangements for the inheritance or yeah. uh, we see them in contract arranging apprenticeships as well. Right. Uh, so we see quite a strong bond with grandparents where grandparents are still alive. Yeah. Now, one of the articles of yours that I read in preparation for this interview was in a big um, read. It's 2013, isn't it? It is, is it yeah. Remind us <laughs> of the title? Um, it's Ch uh, the Oxford Handbook of Childhood and Education in the Greek and Roman World, edited by Tim Parkin, Judith yeah. Evans Grubbs uh, and Rosalind Bell. Brilliant. We'll put a link on the website. But one thing that I noticed, sort of just flipping through the contents mm -hmm. page, was like the sheer range of, of work that's been done on childhoods in antiquity and I, I just wondered is that a new thing or is that just my perception? Well uh, the study of childhood is going through a, a bit of a resurgence at the okay. moment. Um, well, why is that? Yeah. Uh, well it's an interesting topic yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also I, th I think since Beryl Rawson's work in the 1980s it's been an interesting topic for social history generally, children and the family and the roles that, that children and the family play in society and culture more broadly. So what, was Beryl Rawson a bit of a pioneer? What were her Definitely, ideas? Definitely, yeah. 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 Uh, so she was a pioneer in putting children and the family at the focal point of cultural and, and social history. Mm. Um, but since her work, the uh, a lot of the, the field has moved on and moved away slightly from considerations of legal text and legal documents and trying to, to find out the you know, what we can say about children's actual lives and experiences. Um, and we still get a sense that a lot of work over the past couple of decades has focused on what you might think of as the symbolic aspects of childhood and what it meant to adults. Mm. Um, but we're seeing more and more work being done on uh, children's experience in an attempt to try and get a sense of their own perspectives of, of, of their lives. And does that reflect work that's been done in other on other periods of history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We find in other periods of history, so from the early modern world uh, and onwards, but also in Chinese history as well, we're seeing uh, this kind of development. Right. We're also seeing it in archaeology and the use of modern sociological studies, of childhood studies, yeah. uh, to try and understand children in the past yeah. and their agency uh, and what kind of role they played in culture. It is a fascinating topic. Um, apart from your Oxyrhynchus. <laughs> Project. Um, what, what's next for you? Are you going to do more articles <laughs> on this subject? Yeah, I'm, I, I, I've recently written an article on uh, children's cultures, uh, exploring the ways in which children shared culture with one another in Egypt uh, through toys and dolls and, oh. and this, this kind of thing as well. Um, and I'm looking at uh, children in villages uh, of Roman Egypt, uh, particularly within the structure of, of houses and the household structures they lived in, in the villages. Yeah. Um, it's, there's certainly a lot of material to work with uh, in, in Egypt, so yeah. it's a matter of uh, 
digging down and finding it all and trying to explore it in particular ways and trying to get a sense of children's experiences. Well, thank you very much for telling us about your work on childhood. It's a fascinating topic and best of luck with it. Thanks, Jess. Thanks.